So here's the thing, the J-10 is the workhorse of the Chinese Air Force. There are more than 500 of them in service, even more than all the flanker variants altogether. In the previous video we analyzed the history and the general configuration. Today we get into the details of performance and systems, at least for what is available in the open source. There are three main variants of the J-10, the A, the B and the C, and the C being the current variant. All of them with increasing level of technology and systems. The difference between A and B is massive, it includes a new engine and a new DSI intake. The difference between B and C is limited, but the C version includes a Chinese engine built in China rather than a Russian engine. Between A, B and C, however, there is a massive difference in electronics and warfare systems. Actually, upgrading the A's to the B level seems probably not possible, but it is in principle possible to upgrade the B to the C variant, at least partially, at least for the systems. There are also several minor variants. For example, there is a J10A display variant, which is used by the Chinese National Aerobatics Team as an airshow aircraft. There is a naval variant of the J10A, which is the J10AH, which is not carrier capable, but is used by the uh, Chinese Navy. The only difference with the J10A seems to be anti-corrosion treatment and the capability of using some naval weapons. The J-10S and the J-10SH are dual seaters, normally used for training, but they do retain all their combat capabilities. Then we had the J-10B TVC, which was used to test and experiment with thrust vectoring. And finally, there is a J-10CE variant of the J-10 designed for export. We have very few official numbers about the J-10 and the sources are pretty much all over the place. An interesting point though is that B and C versions seem to be longer, larger and taller than the A version and you wouldn't say that by just looking at the pictures. Actually B and C seem a bit shorter. Making sense of the engine versions is complicated. All the sources differ slightly with what happened with the propulsion. If I understand correctly, both the B and C variants can be propelled both by the Chinese WS-10 or the Russian Saturn AL-31 FN, but the aircraft currently in production use the WS-10. To be honest, there are both engines in the class of 90 kN drive, 140 kN with afterburner, so the difference in performance, while noticeable, is probably not substantial. Anyway, for those who are passionate about these things, here is a summary of all the specifications. Well, it's difficult to have this kind of information, even for Western aircraft, even for the commissioned aircraft. You can imagine how easy it is with Chinese aircraft. So the J-10C main sensor is the KLJ-7A AISA radar, which is entirely developed in China. Recently, some details about this unit have emerged on a Chinese news site, but I don't know how reliable the source is. So basically I'm trying an educated guess from now on. So the radar has about thousand elements in a very compact antenna uh, which are a bit fewer than the equivalent Russian engine designs. The main antenna can be mounted on a rotating inclined plate like it happens for the Gripen's Raven or the Eurofighter's Captor. This feature is called a repositioner or improperly a swash plate and it helps open 
eliminating one of the few drawbacks of the AESA radars that is the relatively narrow cone of the radar which is about 60 degrees on each side. So rotating the antenna makes possible to point the radar beams around a much larger circular sector, even larger than 180 degrees which incidentally is the max that you can achieve with a mechanically scanned radar. Notice that I said the main antenna because this unit may have two lateral arrays like the N036 of the Suhoi 57, each array of about 700 elements. However, these arrays seem not to be installed on the J10C. The radar is working in the usual X-band, it can track up to 15 targets uh, at the same time and it can provide guidance for four weapons always at the same time. The maximum detection distance of a fighter-sized aircraft, around 4 square meter, is reported to be 170 kilometers, which is pretty good. It is uncertain if the radar has LPI features, but honestly would be wasted if it didn't, so... Well, I also understand that probably needs explaining what is an LPI radar. A normal radar has a relatively regular scan pattern with the antenna moving irregularly from one side to another or moving circularly and it has usually just one beam. LPI radar you can have more beams, irregular emissions, different pulse repetition frequencies, you can also hop between frequencies while you are emitting and also you can use different and varied waveforms. All these features make it difficult for a sensor to recognize those emissions as the emissions of a radar. What seems unlikely though is the light weight of this unit which is reported to be about 110 kilos and the diameter of the antenna is only 60 centimeter. If this is the case this is a very compact unit. The maximum radar power is not declared, but it is to be seen if the electrical power availability on the J-10 is sufficient to use the radar to the max. The aircraft was originally designed with a different radar and different systems and we don't know if the electrical power available on board could grow adequately. Actually I'm mentioning this because the availability of electrical power is probably the main factor that is limiting the upgrade of combat aircraft. However, like every modern fighter, J-10B and J-10C are actually equipped with an infrared search and track which is mounted in the classical position in front of the cockpit and above the radar. Very little is known about this unit. What we have is a reported detection range of 40 kilometers for an aircraft approaching the J-10 and 100 kilometers from the rear aspect. However, all these numbers related to the distances, performances, number of aircraft that can be tracked and so on must always be taken with a truckload of salt because a pinch is probably not enough. I have zero doubt that these numbers are not accurate and even the western ones they are generally not accurate and they are not for two reasons. The first is we don't know all the details on how these performances are actually calculated. Second, everybody has an incentive to this information. So, I leave the judgment to you. There are several other systems of the J-10, but the connections between these systems are a bit peculiar. In fact, the J-10 uses a standard ARINC 429 data bus. A data bus is the equivalent of a local area network, it is the equivalent of those cables that you plug into your computer when you are not using Wi-Fi. Peculiarity in this case is that the ARINC 429 is not a Chinese standard, it is an international standard and it is a civilian standard, it is used on civilian aircraft. In the West, the de facto standard for military data buses is the MIL-STD 1553, but you can't expect the Chinese or the Russians to use it. What is a bit surprising though it is that the Chinese military is relying on a civilian standard. It would be understandable if there were foreign weapons and systems using this standard, but if they exist are actually few and far between. 
I personally never heard of one. If you know any better about the use of the Arink 429, well, the comment section below is open to everyone, so please let me know. The data bus connects several systems on the aircraft. The aircraft features an air data computer, a quadruplex fly-by-wire system, a mission management computer, and a GPS INS navigation unit that we know nothing about. These computers drive three multifunctional displays in the cockpit, plus a panoramic head-up displays, plus a helmet-mounted sight. The radar warning receiver is named ARW9101. A. It works from S to Q band, it features four antennas, and the threat library to identify radar emitters is a national Chinese library. This system is believed to be integrated with the chaffs and flares dispensers uh, to create an automated protection suite. And to add to the protection of the J10B and C, a missile approach warning system has been installed, making the aircraft more survivable. The aircraft is obviously equipped with an IFF whose antenna is visible behind the cockpit, at least we think. On the J10C there is another blade antenna behind the IFF antenna and analysts believe it is used by a data link to guide the PL-15 air-to-air missile. However, this is speculation and we can't really be sure. And speaking of data links, I didn't find any reference to the type of data links that are installed on the aircraft, because it would be very strange if it had none. The Chinese have developed their own high-speed data link, which is called a DTS-03, with a capability of about 2 megabits per second and a range of about 400 kilometers. They also received the Russian data links when they received the flankers, so I would expect that one or both of these types to be actually available on board the J-10. Around the tail of the aircraft there are a few antennas that have been identified probably as VOR uh, slash localizer antennas, but probably there is more going on there. In fact there are some features on the tail that make us think that they, they are electronics housings. For example we know nothing about an electronic countermeasure suite on board the aircraft. The J-10A used to be seen with an ECM pod, the J-10B and C less so unless we are talking a configuration for suppression of air defenses. Considering the importance that in recent times the Chinese are giving to electronic warfare, it really seems likely that the aircraft has some form of jammers on board. So as you can see there is a lot of speculation about what is going on and the analysts have to work with the news that filter in the press or the pictures that are available on the internet. Unfortunately I'm old enough to remember when during the Cold War this kind of speculations were a constant buzz in the specialized press. In the next and final video we are going to discuss the aircraft armament. In the meanwhile there are several other videos about China and there is the first part of this series that are going to appear beside me. If you haven't already I would suggest you to watch them. So thank you very much for watching and see you there.